is not here. Stop. Set. This is Michael Faulkner, and it is showtime at the November 29th, 2016 edition of the Weekly Podioplex. Brought to you on the Chronic Rift Network. This week's birthdays include Julianne Moore, recently of The Hunger Games, Doctor Who's Girl Who Waited, Karen Galan, Chadwick Boseman, The Black Panther from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Kevin Conroy, Batman from the DC Animated Universe, Deep Roy, also known as Keenzer from the Star Trek reboot films, TV's Urkel, Jaleel White, and Bill Nye the Science Guy. Bill, Bill, Bill! Starting with the box office report, one newcomer did well, but the rest? Well, let's start with number 12, and new release, Rules Don't Apply, premiering to $1.6 million over three days and $2.2 million over the five-day holiday weekend. The three-day take is the worst wide opening of 2016, and the sixth worst opening all time for a film debuting in over 2,000 theaters. Critics give it a 57% reception, and audiences scored it with a B- cinema score, but the final analysis shows that quirky, offbeat romantic comedies just aren't as popular in today's market. Back to the normal countdown at number 10 is Edge of 17, which premiered at 7th last week and dropped 3 this week. At number 9 is Hacksaw Ridge, down 3 from 6th. In 8th is Almost Christmas, down 3 from 5th. In 7th is new release Bad Santa 2, premiering with $6.2 million over 3 days and 9.1 over 5. The first Bad Santa debuted to $12.3 million 13 years ago, which marks a 50% drop between movies. Audiences were far from impressed with a C-plus cinema score, and critics followed suit with a 25% approval. Finishing off this week's bottom five is Trolls, down three from third. The top five this week begin with Arrival, down one from fourth with $11.5 million, added to a total of $62.6 million. In fourth place is new release Allied, earning $12.7 million over three days and $17.7 million over five. That's within expectations, but against an $85 million budget, this is definitely a disappointment. It's also a low for director Robert Zemeckis, who finds himself nursing this second box office failure in a row behind last year's The Walk. Allied scored a B grade from audiences and a 62% from critics, and that may carry it through the first part of December until 2016 goes out with a Death Star-sized bang. In third place is Doctor Strange, down one from second with $13.7 million. In second is last week's winner, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, adding $45.1 million to a total of $156 million. This ninth entry in J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World premiered at the bottom of the franchise, but the film's global total has it at 13th among all of 2016's releases. Taking over in first this week is Moana, earning $56.6 million in three days and $82.1 million in five The five-day opening ranks as the second largest Thanksgiving debut ever, placing it behind Frozen and the incredibly close Toy Story 2. That means that Disney now owns nine of the top ten five-day and three-day Thanksgiving weekend openings, and the only title on each list that doesn't belong to the Mouse House is New Line's Four Christmases. The three-day premiere for Moana marks the third largest opening for Walt Disney Animation Studios, behind Zootopia and Big Hero 6. Moana scored an A from audiences and a 98% from critics, so this one's going to have a pretty good run until Star Wars returns in December. Let's close out the box office report with a look at what was winning in years gone by. Five years ago in 2011, The Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 1 took number one for a third and final week with $16.5 million. Ten years ago in 2006, Happy Feet won the weekend for a third and final week with $17.5 million. 
20 years ago in 1996, 101 Dalmatians was the winner with $33.5 million. And it's at this point I realize that I missed the 20th anniversary of Star Trek First Contact last week. But that's okay, because we do get to celebrate another Trek milestone this week. 30 years ago, in 1986, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home took the title with $16.9 million. And 40 years ago, in 1976, Carrie took the box office crown with $3.5 million in its fourth weekend of release. The box office premiere for December 2nd is this week's headliner, and that one is Incarnate. A horror thriller starring Carice Van Houten, Aaron Eckhart, and David Masus. Where's his father? He's probably out getting drunk. We need to bring him here. That man is not coming anywhere near my son. Listen. He broke Cameron's arm! This entity is strong. Probably the strongest I've ever encountered. To get your son back, I'm gonna need all the ammunition I can get. No, it's not gonna happen. Damn it, listen to me! I am too close. I have come too far. So you either work with me or you lose your son. A scientist with the ability to enter the subconscious minds of the possessed must save a young boy from the grips of a demon with powers never seen before, all while facing the horrors of his past. This is kind of a DC Universe reunion of sorts. I mean, Aaron Eckhart was Two-Face in The Dark Knight, and David Masuz is currently Bruce Wayne. Incarnate is rated PG-13. There are also four titles on this week's limited slate, and you can find those in the show notes. Next up is a look at the home entertainment slate for the week of November 29th, and I'll begin with new release on DVD and Blu-ray, and that list begins with Absolutely Fabulous, The Movie. A comedy starring Jennifer Saunders, Joanna Lumley, and Julia Swalla. Adina and Patsy are still oozing glitz and glamour, living the high life they are accustomed to, shopping, drinking, clubbing their way around London's trendiest hotspots. Blamed for a major incident at an uber-fashionable launch party, they become entangled in a media storm and are relentlessly pursued by the paparazzi. Fleeing penniless to the glamorous playground of the super-rich, the French Riviera, they plan to hatch a plan to make their escape permanent and live the high life forevermore. Absolutely Fabulous the Movie is rated R. The second title is The Wild Life, an animated comedy starring Matthias Schwagenhofer, Kaya Yanar, and Ilka Besson. On a tiny exotic island, Tuesday, an outgoing parrot, lives with his quirky animal friends in paradise. However, Tuesday can't stop dreaming about discovering the world. After a violent storm, Tuesday and his friends wake up to discover a strange creature on the beach, Robinson Crusoe. Tuesday immediately views Crusoe as his ticket off the island to explore new lands. And likewise, Crusoe soon realizes that the key to surviving on the island is through the help of Tuesday and the other animals. The Wildlife is rated PG. Number three on the list is The BFG, an animated fantasy film starring Mark Rylance, Ruby Barnhill, and Penelope Wilton. A girl named Sophie encounters the big, friendly giant, who, despite his intimidating appearance, turns out to be a kind-hearted soul who is considered an outcast by the other giants, because unlike them, he refuses to eat children. The BFG is rated PG. Number four on the list is Don't Breathe, a horror thriller starring Dylan Minnette, Jane Levy, and Stephen Lang. A group of teens break into a blind man's home thinking they'll get away with the perfect crime. Spoiler alert, they're wrong. Don't Breathe is rated R. The fifth title is Pete's Dragon, a family drama starring Bryce Dallas Howard, Wes Bentley, and Robert Redford. A young orphan seeks refuge from his abusive adoptive parents with the help of a pet dragon and a couple who live in a lighthouse. Pete's Dragon is rated PG. And the sixth title is Riff Tracks Live, the MST3K reunion show. A comedy collection starring Michael J. Nelson, Kevin Murphy, and Bill Corbett. Mike, Kevin, and Bill were joined on stage by their MST3K colleagues at the State Theater in Minneapolis, to bring it back to their roots in an MST3K cast reunion 
the likes of which have never been seen before. Joining the guys are their old cohorts, Frank Conniff, Trace Ballou, Mary J. Pell, Bridget Nelson, as well as Mystery Science Theater 3000 creator Joel Hodgson and the host of the revived MST, Jonah Ray, for a hilarious night of riffing for Riff Tracks' 20th live event. Taking turns in various permutations to riff on a slew of old-timey shorts, the show culminates in a super riffapalooza finale with all nine riffers on stage at once. Riff Tracks Live, the MST 3K reunion show, is not rated. Swinging by new releases on digital video, I have one title there, that's Bridget Jones's Baby. A romantic comedy starring Renee Zellweger, Patrick Dempsey, and Colin Firth. After breaking up with Mark Darcy, Bridget Jones's Happily Ever After hasn't quite gone according to plan. 40-something and single again, she decides to focus on her job as top news producer and surround herself with old friends and new. For once, Bridget has everything completely under control. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Bridget Jones's Baby is rated R. Moving right along to TV on DVD and Blu-ray, I have one title there. That's House of Lies, Season 5 from 2016, starring Glenn Turman, Don Cheadle, and Ben Schwartz. Now that Khan and Associates is back on top, their biggest mission is staying there. In the fifth and final season of House of Lies, the tight-knit profit-seeking pod launches life-changing moves with some game-changing tactics. Marty Kahn and Jeannie Vanderhoeven venture into new romances while they co-parent their baby daughter. Numbers analyst Doug Guggenheim tackles an item on his bucket list by preparing and delivering a TED Talk, while spin doctor Clyde Oberholt lends his skills to a mayoral candidate. Together, the team's unconventional management style continues to make the corporate waves, and an unexpected offer from the past could alter all of their futures, culminating in a historic series closer filmed in Havana, Cuba. Wrapping up the home entertainment slate with Blu-rays from the past, I bring you one title. That one is Finders Keepers, a comedy from 1984 starring Michael O'Keefe, Beverly D'Angelo, and Louis Gossett Jr. On the run from police and a female roller derby team, Scam artist Michael Rangeloff steals a coffin and boards a train, pretending to be a soldier bringing home a dead war buddy. He gets more than he bargained for from the train and the coffin. Finders Keepers is rated R. After this brief break for about a shameless podcast cross-promotion, the Weekly Podioplex will continue. My name is Karen Lindsay. I got sucked into Farscape. Lou bugged me till I watched. Now I'm obsessed. We podcast together. To guide new viewers. So they also get hooked. Maybe as much as me? One episode per podcast. I would love the company. Both good and bad. Jeremiah Creighton. Lou thinks this will stop me. I can't stop rewatching them. But he's mistaken. He should know me by now. This will be awesome. Talking about characters and stories. These recordings are made for you. To enjoy the wondrous things we've heard. Cross my heart, smack me dead, stick a lobster on my head. On the ground now! Farewell, my friends, and thank you for teaching me to kill again. It's liquor and snot. My microbes had to have translated that one wrongly. This is insane, Craig. Four years on and you're finally getting it. Escape Cast, your guide to the wonders of Far Escape. Listen to the Scaper Chronicles at scapecast.org. And welcome back to the weekly Podioplex. I'm Denise with your Quick Flicks. And I don't sound like death, or feel like death for that matter. Always a preferable state of being. But enough about me, let's dive right in. Did you guys see the new Assassin's Creed clip? You guys should watch the new Assassin's Creed clip, and then join me in a fervent wish that this movie not suck. I really want this movie not to suck. Speaking of not terrible movies, both Kubo and Zootopia have taught the 2017 Annie Awards nominations. 
an awards ceremony founded in 1972 as part of a continued annual effort to celebrate lifetime and career contributions within the film of animation, the ceremony has seen fit to recognize individual films from each year since 1992. This year sees the Disney and Leica films in a tight race to the finish line. According to Variety, Zootopia and Kubo and the Two Strings are current frontrunners for Best Animated Feature, with the Disney film having edged past Leica's with a total of 11 nominations compared to Kubo's 10. Other top contenders include Pixar's Finding Dory, DreamWorks, Kung Fu Panda 3, and Disney's Moana. Another film you really need to go see. I mean, you need to see them all, but Moana is a treat. She is further animated proof a woman can carry her own story and make it succeed without the trappings normally associated with a female-centric movie. Moana is at once beautiful and wildly entertaining. In the past, Annie Awards winners have reflected the most likely Oscar hopefuls in Best Animated Feature category. We're not including the 2006 upset. That was a weird year. Happy Feet was a great movie, but that was a weird year. And we can expect Disney and Leica to be the two most competitive animation studios to watch out for come Oscar time. Personally, I hope Leica wins. The studio has done so much to bring stop-motion animation back to the big screen and prove that it is a viable medium to bring in audiences. And honestly, Kubo was a great movie. It really does deserve an Oscar. In movies which are not necessarily terrible but really didn't have to be made in the first place, B.D. Wong is returning as Henry Wu in Jurassic World 2. Okay, okay, okay. Here's my problem. <laughs> the first three Jurassic Park movies were good. First one is a classic. The second one probably should have never been made in the first place. But the third one sort of redeemed the series. The latest installment in the desperate hope to breathe life into a series which should have stayed in bed years ago was not great. The visuals were good, but old Stevie Spielberg forgot how to write a story or just didn't care enough because yay 3D animation! I could go on and on about this, but the point is the movie was not great and I wish they never would have made it in the first place. As for B.D. Wong coming back, it is a confirmed thing that is happening. He joins previously confirmed Bryce Dallas Howard and Chris Pratt and he's bringing along his dinosaur embryos to boot. While speaking to Cinema Blend, executive producer Frank Marshall had this to say. When they take off in helicopters, you know they're probably going to come back. As for the story, it's pretty obvious they're going to continue with genetic experimentation of some kind because science never learns. What the details are, we're going to have to wait and find out. Skipping over to the small screen, MGM is suing original filmmakers for TV rights to a show I'm way too young to even know the specifics of or what it actually is. Buckaroo Banzai. Okay, originally released, this, and, and keep in mind, I am, I am copying this from the Wikipedia page because I've got no idea. Originally released theatrically in 1984, the Adventurers of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension is, apparently, a celebrated science fiction adventure comedy film originally directed by Walter Richter and written by Earl McRoach. The movie, apparently, centers around the chief exploits of the eponymous protagonist, a physicist, neurosurgeon, test pilot, and rock and roll musician, Buckaroo Banzai. I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, I was born in 1987, y'all. I've only just seen Big Trouble in Little China, okay? <laughs> this central hero saves the world from interdimensional aliens called Red Lectroids from Planet 10. He is aided in his, in his pursuits by the heroic Hong Kong Cavaliers, though I don't think they'll be helping him out much in a court of law. MGM has approached filmmaker Kevin Smith to develop a TV series based on the original film, with Amazon interested in distribution. However, Richter and Roach aren't exactly keen on ceding the rights to the film property. MGM has slammed them with a lawsuit. According to Deadline, MGM has officially filed a 26-page lawsuit in order to defend the studio's rights to pursue producing a TV series despite Richter and Roach's protests. MGM filed the following statement. There is now a substantial controversy between the parties with great immediacy. MGM seeks to develop its new television series without defendants' interference. Accordingly, plaintiffs bring this action to seek a declaration of the rights and legal relations of the parties with regard to Buckaroo Banzai. Honestly, I don't believe... I, I really don't blame Richter and Roach. Buckaroo Banzai is a classic, apparently. 
and some classics need to be left out of remake Happy Hollywood's clutches. And now we're jumping this admittedly strange, strange little ship and doing something wholly unexpected. If you remember last time, I talked about Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I'm a Harry Potter fan, have been since the very first book came out, but I will admit to fatigue. I stopped watching the fourth movie, and I really haven't been keeping up with the latest updates to Pottermore and the rest of the lore except to get my Ilvermorny house, wand, and Patronus. I am a Hufflepuff, will always be a Hufflepuff, and Deadpool is a Hufflepuff, so the rest of y'all who say my house is lame no longer have a valid argument, so shush. Apart from these things, I haven't done much with that part of my admittedly very large fandom. I love Harry Potter, but I'm not in love with Harry Potter. I did, however, go see the new movie. What follows is a spoiler-free review of Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Let me start by saying Eddie Remain is a fantastic Newt Scamander. He is at once awkward and so painfully endearing, it makes me so proud to be a Hufflepuff. Because seriously, I am that kind of awkward. I know it doesn't sound like I am on the podcast, but I am. I really, really, really am. The movie takes place in 1920s New York, 56 years before Voldemort and that whole mess. We're introduced to the main plot of the movie, namely Grindelwald and his destruction, by a series of newspaper articles. Not spinning newspapers, but papers with ink that moves. Following this, we're introduced to Newt and given hints of the magical world as he gets off the ferry at Ellis Island and steps into a hot mess of senatorial elections, New Salem conspiracy theorists, a disgraced Aurora who is really just looking to get back into her old job, and her empathic witch sister a Niffler that won't stay inside the briefcase, and a whole host of various monsters and beasties who wreak havoc wherever they go. Most specifically, the Obscurus. What follows is a truly heartwarming little story about friendship, sacrifice, and misguided beliefs in peoples and governments. What starts it is an ill-fated trip to the bank by Jacob Kowalski, the man who is the audience's layman into the wizarding world by means of an innocuous little briefcase that is way bigger on the inside. And lack of collateral for a bakery, which is just the greatest. You couldn't have chosen a better cast for the movie. Problematic Johnny Depp aside, the rest of the cast is absolutely top-notch, though not as diverse as the wizarding world might have you believe it is. Carmen Ejogo, as president of the Magical Congress of the United States of America, is the only person of color besides Zoe Kravitz in the whole movie and the only one who has a speaking role. It is a real shame. Not only does it not reflect the U.S. of the past, one would think the wizarding world would be a lot more colorful, and not just in clothing. True to form, the wizarding half of the world is worried about the nomash, or muggle, half of the world finding out they exist and the ever-growing threat that is Grindelwald. He is no joke, and I can see where Voldemort got his ideas. Newt Scamander and his beast complicates the delicate operation of wizards hiding in plain sight. Jacob Kowalski further complicates matters, and I have never been more against the Obliviate spell in my whole life as I was with this movie. While the story trucks along well enough, the movie doesn't quite live up to the magic you want it to have. This could be for a number of reasons, not least of which the lack of stronger characterizations of the main cast. This is hard to do in a two-hour runtime, but watching the movie, I felt like I was missing out on something. I feel like, had this been a book series before going onto the big screen, there would have been more material to work with, more depth of character, and everything, really. J.K. Rowling would have been able to stretch her imagination and sink her teeth in, giving us another layer in the Harry Potter universe. The movie, however, feels a lot flat, despite stellar performances from the cast and some truly wonderful emotional moments. Connections in the movie are easy to make, as far as story goes. And the beasts, while inventive and stunningly realized in CG, are not as clever as First Blush would have them be. They are a visual treat, to be sure, but their origins are easy enough to understand and name, and by this time one would think J.K. Rowling would rely less on mythology, established mythology, and more on her own imagination to really make this world of hers more three-dimensional and less like a paper cutout of the mythology section in the library. The strength of the movie, however, comes from two places. One, the relationship between Newt Scamander and Jacob Kowalski, and the bare-bone Goldstein Cra Graves subplot. Jacob Kowalski is a gem of a character, and I found myself wanting to scream out, No, you can't do that! by the end of the movie. Of course, they did the thing, and I cried, but that's neither here nor there. That's what the second movie is for. 
The barebone Goldstein Graves subplot weaves in the obscurus and the familiar story of abuse. This really is where Rowling shines, and I wish there was more done with this. Honestly, I do. Had she been able to weave Newt into this particular storyline on more than just a cursory, convenient to the plot level, the movie would have been all the richer for it. That being said, the movie was not terrible. First in the series had the toughest job of setting up the world and characters. Perhaps this was made easier by revisiting a world we already know, but I don't think so. This is a different wizarding world, and Fantastic Beast did its best to set up and push us to the next movie, leaving just enough unanswered questions to keep us coming back for more, but that's really all it did. I think what made the Harry Potter movies special was missing in this one. It, it almost felt like a glossing over, a, a here's the world, you know, some things happened in it, and here you go. However, barring this, the movie still gets a 6.5 out of 10, and again, this is because of the strength of the characters and their interactions to each other. And though the movie finds itself worthy of the universe it inhabits, maybe it should have been a book series first. All right, guys, that's it for me on this week's Quick Flicks. I'll see you next time on the Weekly Patio Plex. Thank you, Denise. With that, we come to the end of this week's edition of the Weekly Patio Plex. If you want to discuss anything you heard on this week's edition, please take a moment to get in touch. You can surf on over to the brand new homepage at chronicrift.com and leave an audio message right there on the website using your microphone, or you can write to weeklypatioplex at gmail.com. Of course, you can still tweet us on Twitter. The Chronic Rift is chronic underscore rift. The Weekly Patioplex is Weekly Patioplex. Denise is Riley James Keith. And I am Womprat99, like the creature Liquid Bullseye in his T16 in Beggar's Canyon. You can give the Chronic Rift a thumbs up on Stitcher Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes, and you can find the Weekly Patioplex and the Chronic Rift on Facebook and Google+. Take a moment, stop on by, and see what other shows the Chronic Rift Network has to offer. We have Cyborgs, a bionic podcast, the Batcave podcast, the OSI Files podcast, the G2V podcast, Generations Geek, presenting the transcription feature, the Dan and Travis show, the Sci-Fi Diner podcast, and so much more. Check us out and find the culture in pop culture. If you're interested in more of my adventures, take a quick trip to my blog, Creative Criticality, where I'm watching every episode of Doctor Who for the first time from the very beginning of the franchise and reviewing them in the Timestamps Project. Right now, the blog is in the middle of the 15th season with the adventures of the fourth Doctor. In fact, I'm just about to publish the image of Fendal. And the link to those reviews can be found in the show notes. You can also find Creative Criticality on Facebook. Denise can also be found on the internet at Accessories Not Included, where she talks about her writing, reviews books, and offers her services as a cover designer. Check her out at AccessoriesNotIncluded.com. If you decide to pick up any of this week's new releases, why not do it through our Amazon store? You get the newest entertainment Amazon's low prices and high quality service, and each purchase you make that store supports the Chronic Rift Network. Your support keeps us on the air, and we appreciate your consideration. Look for the links to our best bets and the network store in our show notes, or click the Amazon box on the website. The Weekly Patio Plex is a Lucky Shot production and is produced by John S. Drew. On behalf of Denise and John, this is Michael Faulkner. Thanks for listening. Until next time, there are adventures and drama, comedy and action, worlds to explore in the depths of film. Get some popcorn, find your favorite seat, and I'll see you at the theater.